This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. Today, I'm ready to receive the incorruptible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. I'll never be the same again. Come on. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. Best shout ever. Come on now, welcome Louie to the house. Man, you give me way too much credit. All I did was, was listen. That's really all I did. I remember that moment because I don't say much profound. I really don't. <clears throat> um, but when him and I were on the phone, I said, let, let me just stop you. Yeah, the Bible says that the gift and calling of God is without, without repentance. You need to preach. You need to preach. Um, I remember that like it was yesterday. Uh, Mark has been extremely influential in my life so much. This was his Bible. It's got his name on it and everything. Um, yeah, I've got like six or seven of his Bibles. Um, because when I met him, I was so hungry for God. Um, I was in a little Baptist church, and, and I can't believe he remembered this, but I, I would go to church, and I would listen, and it was good. And, but at the end of the service, I, I had to get saved every single week because it didn't make sense. And, and I would say, I met him, and we got to talking. I said, you know, my Bible's this thick, but it only feels like it's about, you know, this thick. Uh, where's the miracles and where's the power at? I mean, salvation is great, don't get me wrong, but, but I wanted more and I knew there, there was more in the Bible. So, um, so he was very influential in me and um, so I have a lot of his Bibles and his notes. He would scribble down on napkins and, and I just wanted it all. I just wanted because I, I really grew up without a father. My real dad was an alcoholic. My stepdad was a jerk. Um, so I didn't really, really have a dad. So I was just in a place in my life where I met Mark. I was just very hungry um, for God. And he's been my spiritual father ever since. So, so this, uh, I was going to say this morning, it's amazing how programmed we are when it comes to church. This morning, beautiful Sunday morning. Um, um, I have a wife, April. Um, and I have two daughters, Hannah and Emma. This is Emma Faith here with me. Uh, Hannah, my oldest, just graduated college from the University of Florida. So very proud of her. Very proud college graduate. Um, she loves being in the game. So good for her. So proud of her. Just so glad. Walked across that stage and did the thing there. And just great. She graduated from the University of Florida. I, look, I know. I'm with you. I'm with you. I get it. She gave me a keychain with a Florida Gator on it. Now, you may be Gator fans. Some of you may be. I highly doubt it in Georgia country. But she gave me a keychain, and, and I looked at it. I'm like, you're really giving me this? And she said, yeah. I'm like, a, a Gator keychain? Yeah. Okay. So I did two things with it. I was proud of her. She's going to a Division I college, university, and I prayed for her. Then I shoved it deep down into my pocket with pocket lint and dust and ketchup packets. Didn't really care, uh, but I am proud of her. Very proud of my daughter. Um, great kid. Didn't give us any trouble. Stellar athlete. Should have played softball for a major university. She was really good. Cutthroat. No mercy at all. Still has no mercy. She just was great. Emma is the artistic one. She's the loving one. She's the, the dancer and the singer and the musician. Hannah would step on your throat to win every time, but it made her a great athlete. Um, I got here because I've known your pastor and his family for 25 years. He said a lot. We've worked together doing lots of different things. We've, we've dressed up, and we used, to, <laughs> we used to pat our bellies with pillows, and we don't have to do that anymore. Um, <laughs> Um, but we used to, and it was fun, and we, we've done a lot. We've laughed, we've cried, uh, but he's not just your pastor. He's mine as well. Um, I'm extremely selective about who I let speak into my heart spiritually. I just am. You can call me selfish. I am. Uh, a lot of great Bible teachers, a lot of great godly people in life. I'm just really, really particular about who speaks into my heart, but he's one. He's the one, actually. I always, I always uh, liken him to the prophet Samuel. 
uh, his words just don't fall to the ground. They just don't. They are powerful. So you're very, very blessed to have this entire family in your life. You just really are. Um, yeah, you should. Um, every, time, every time I come here, I feel like I've been to a conference. I'm writing notes. Man, they did that. They got their, their you know, that guy's doing the internet, and he's doing and I'm writing notes. And, and I swear, if I was at McDonald's, I would take ketchup packets, and I'd draw notes on napkins just to get information. Because when I come here, I get lots of information. So I love coming here. It, it ramps me up spiritually, like two or three levels. Um, I, just love, I just love coming here. Uh, the first message I ever heard him speak was about Moses and uh, the staff of Moses. And you all are familiar with the story. Uh, God said, what's that in your hand? Staff, throw it on the ground. It turned to a serpent, struck the rock, and it made water, you know, divide the Red Sea. And his message was, uh, God can take the most insignificant thing in your life and do something extremely powerful with it, right? So I'm listening to his message, and he would say, he said, bow your heads, and I'm, I'm bowing, and, and he said, what's that insignificant thing, not what you're known for or what you're good at, the, the hobby or the, the, the little bitty tiny thing in your life? And, and, I, and I, I, I prayed, and I said, God, I would love to be able to sing and lead worship. That would be great. Well, now what I do for my church at Antioch is I'm the worship pastor. So I actually get a salary, and we have 11 of us on stage. It's like earth, wind, and fire. If you don't know who that is, ask your parents. They'll tell you there's a lot of us. And I look around, and I sit, look at our band, and I'm like, God, you know, it's crazy. I got there. There were three. Now there's 11. Um, I'm just very, very humbled by, by that. But remember, I, I just had this man, just incredible, incredible gifted uh, communicator. Um, but this morning, I want you to say this with me. We are here. We are here. I love the church. I, I just love being in the church. I love the design of the church. I love the fact that God's design was to bring in to his house mechanics and, and, and CPAs and electricians and teachers and blue-collar people and white-collar people and just people. Love, love the design. Uh, I told you about my daughter, Hannah. Um, uh, she's been in Gainesville for four years Went to church once. That's another thing for another time. Um, I said that to tell you this. She got down there. Her, her car quit working. Uh, she, so she calls me. Dad, my car's not running. Okay, honey, I'll get in the car. I'll be there in 10 hours. Crazy, right? So I called Advance Auto. Complete stranger. She goes. She gets Hannah a battery, puts it in. Uh, just complete favor of God. So she calls me back, Dad, my, my power's not working. Honey, I'm on my way to be there in 10 hours. Just silly. So look at your breaker box outside. You'd have your apartment number on it. Somebody had turned it off. Okay, are other power off in your apartment? No, everybody's on, but ours. Honey, this is attacked by, by boys that want to meet you. They want to flip your breaker back on, tell you they're all big and bad. You know, it's just how guys work sometimes. We're idiots most of the time, but we mean well. But I said that to say, because I tell her a lot, if you would just get in a church, you could have people that could help you. Like I said, it's, it's a beautiful design. But that's we are here. Say it with me again. We are here. In, in the Bible, if you want to make your way to Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6 is where we'll be for a little bit. Um, but before that, Luke chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus talking says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, and love your neighbors yourself. Mark was telling me the two core values um, within this church is discipleship and relationship. The two things that make us grow and who we are. Two things that Jesus talked about from the beginning. He took all the commandments, summed them up into one. If you would just love the Lord your God with everything you got, discipleship, and love your neighbors yourself, relationship. So in Galatians chapter 6, um, we will read that together starting at verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is called in any transgression, you who are spiritual, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Verse 6. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. 
For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are the household of faith. I love this passage for what we're going to talk about this morning. Or this morning, this evening, say it with me again. We are here. Number one, to be people of restoration. We are here to walk with each other, live with each other. It said, the verse one said, you who are spiritual. Let me ask you a question. Are you? Are you spiritual? Or if you're like some churches, they just dump everything on the staff. We know Mark's spiritual. We'll let Mark deal with people that are caught in issues. We'll let Mark and the staff deal with people. We'll let Miss June and Mr. Gene deal with people. We'll let Miss Robin deal with people. We'll let Michael or Olivia deal with people. We'll let it, see how it is? It's really not, it's you. It, it, Paul said brothers, right? Hey, family, hey, church, you who are spiritual, that's us. The word spiritual just means this. It means relating to religious things. What we just sang pointed us straight to Jesus Christ. I don't know what that one song was, but I'm going to talk to Michael about it. Um, strong, strong by the blood. We, we sang it, the, the battles. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I was just sitting there going, oh, what a beautiful song. I don't know how much of that was just the spirit working. Beautiful, beautiful song. Here's what I love about music, and I'll just echo what Mark said a little bit. You know, you may not, you may not grab anything I'm going to say tonight, not one thing, but there's a, that song will stick in your head. We'll go to our car singing. We'll go to, hitting the radio will be the first thing. Music is a beautiful tool that God has done. Beautiful. I love music. But we are here to be people of restoration. We are to restore with the spirit of gentleness. We are to suggest we need to return people to their former condition. When Mark walked with me and I walked with him, that's the beautiful thing about relationships. It's, it's trust. My daughter Hannah, who I love very much, is a lesbian. Now, when she told me, um, I listened, I listened closely, I asked questions, but that's what she told me. The next morning, I called him and bounced him out of his bed at 6.30, crying my eyes out. I mean, not just a boo-hoo. I mean, I, was, I couldn't even talk. I couldn't say a word because I was frozen with fear. I was locked up. I was sad. I, I didn't know what to do. But because of relationship that God designs for us, I was able to call him and talk and weep, and he just let me cry, and then he would talk to me. Same thing when he walked through his valley, he would call, he would cry, and we would just cry again. I would just let him cry. Listen, I, I don't know what your social status is. I don't care where you live, what you drive, what you wear. I don't care if you have a comma in the checkbook. One of the biggest compliments you could pay anyone is to be a good listener. You realize that? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. It does not matter about, well, no, I'm not, I'm not educated enough. You don't have to be. You have an ear? Then, then you qualify. But we'll let, we'll let Mark deal with that. No, you who are spiritual can deal with things, can listen to things. Just, just be a good listener. You don't have to have all the answers. Just be a good listener. And all I've tried to do, and I still try to do, just be a good listener. Listen when people want to talk. Um, and that's what I've tried to do. That's what we we'll continue to do. That's what we all do and we all should do. Just be a good listener. Even when my wife is talking, I try to be a good listener. Even when the ball game is on, and she's done this to me twice. I'm watching the game. Football is the only sport I like to watch. I don't care about the other stuff. I, don't care. I just don't care. But I love football. Fourth quarter, fourth down, seconds to go, team's on the goal line. She cuts TV off. Twice. She did that to me. Yes. Because I wasn't listening. Well, she got my attention. So, but you know what? I was okay with that. Because what she had to say was far more important than, than my team probably going to lose anyway. Okay? Yeah, look, I, I, I love where I live. We, if you look at the state of Tennessee, we are on the far right at the very tip. Um, and I, it's a beautiful place to live. Let me back up and talk to you a little bit more about restoration. Proverbs twenty four sixteen says this. 
The righteous fall seven times but rises again, and the, whip, the wicked fall by calamity. Now, don't, don't, don't roll by that. Righteous people fall. Righteous people, good people, people that love Jesus Christ, godly people, blood born by Christ Jesus' sacrifice, good people fall. But the key is they rise again. Sadly, 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 people kick, kick us when we're down. When I went through my divorce, you would have thought I had leprosy. I had just got ordained from this church here, and then I started working in this church here as a youth pastor. So between two churches, about 400 people. So you were not there. but and So out of 400 people, I want you to guess how many people called me at home when I was going through my divorce. Anybody want to give a number? I'm not a mathematician, but I know if you take 400, multiply it by zero, you get... That's how many phone calls I received at home from two churches. So you're saying, well, surely they come up the driveway to visit you. Surely they did that. Okay, 400 people times zero people coming up the driveway. Zero phone calls equals what? Zero. So that, that's what happens. Is when people go through difficult times, we stay as far away as we can from people. I, I personally hate that. So when I see and I hear people are struggling, I go to them because I just want to be a good listener. I really am trying to be like a Barnabas. I don't have all the answers. I don't even, I don't even try. I'll just sit quietly, just talk. You know, what, what can I do? And I mean that, what can I do? I can't do everything, but I'm not supposed to. I'm just supposed to be a good friend. A friend loves at all times. That sounds good when you're going to the ball game. Hey, we're friends. Iron sharpening out. We're going to go to the ball game. It'll be great. But all times means all times. All times. Righteous people fall seven times, but hallelujah, they rise again. I don't know your story, but I know that probably everyone in this room probably has struggled. I mean, heck, people were up here lining up to pray for things, for issues. There are things that we all battle. There's things that we all get entangled in. That we all know that there's sins that just easily beset us. I hate that, but it's true. It's so true that there's issues for all of us, but it doesn't define us. You know, Marx is right. I met a beautiful woman named April. We had two girls. But you would have thought in that moment, no one would ever have ever let me hold a microphone and open a Bible and talk, ever. And I love people. And sadly, there's churches that still won't. For whatever reason, that's just how they are. But thank God that, Jesus, that the Bible says that we get to rise again. We are to be listening and loving. Um, we are here, say it with me, we are here to show compassion. We are to show compassion on each other. We are here to bear each other's burdens. The Bible says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, Right? Sadly, we rejoice with those who weep and weep with those who rejoice. Really, we've got it backwards. It's like we make fun of people that are going through bad, bad times in their life. It's sad. We are to sit and cry with people and sit and laugh with people. It's relational. I tell people all the time, I'd rather be relational than religious. I just would, I love being relational. My daughter's a lesbian, and you know what I do? I love her. I love her with everything I got. I got a good friend of mine. Was it Mark? Another friend of mine said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to love her. And he said, well, are you supporting her in college? Yeah, you need to cut her off. Why would I do that? That's my kid. You think God would cut me off when I screw up? No. He shows me mercy. He shows me grace. Every church should be on the corner of grace and mercy. Really? Really? Because I've learned more about the Bible as a father than probably about anything else. Because I have kids of my own. I love her with everything I've got. And still love her with everything i got. I was at a conference. She called me, Dad, my laptop's broken. Okay, uh, what do you need? Uh, well, I want an uh, Apple MacBook Pro. Oh. <laughs> oh, really? Well, uh, 
<clears throat> can you get that? Like, you know, Amazon's clearance. <laughs> Long story, I loved her, and we got her a new laptop because I'm not holding anything back from her. Because, look, God holds nothing back from us, right? Aren't, you, aren't we glad? Aren't we glad that he lavishes us with grace and mercy? Say it with me. We are here to show humility. As, as, as a worship pastor of our band, I pray for, for humble musicians. I pray, I beg God to send me people that are humble. Because James says this, it says that God opposes the proud and gives grace to who? Amen. Gives grace to the humble. If we have people that are all about themselves, then we've completely missed it. They may be a great singer, great drummer, great this, great that, and that's great, but it's just not about you. It is about using that incredible gift to bring Jesus Christ glory and honor, about lifting him up and drawing people to you. I love humility. I, I'm just a person that loves God and loves people, and I'm trying to live it out, even in the midst of my own mistakes. That's really, that's really it. I love our group. I love what we do but it's not about how great they are. It's about using that great gift to bring Christ's glory and honor. It says in verse 3 of Galatians, thinking you're something when you're nothing. Remember that math I told you about? You can have, you can have it all. You can live in the right place or drive this or, or have a comma in your checkbook. But if you multiply that by zero relationship, you're nothing. You're nothing. But if you take all that, you could be like the widow that cast two mites into a brass spittoon, multiplied by one relationship, one hope, one faith, one Lord at one moment, and you have it all. Oh, my gosh, that's good. That's all of us. Love, love humility. I'm the kind of person that when I get around people that are arrogant, I button up. I'm very professional. I, don't, I'm, I still listen, but I'm not easy. I'm not laid back. I just listen. Mm, mm, mm. It, it becomes a business to me. But when I get around people that are like me, just human beings, oh, I love that. I just love that. I love the fact that, that people understand what humility is. Because as humble people, God will give us grace. That word grace is the word charisma. It means gifts. God will give us more just by being humble people. Say it with me. We are here for personal growth. We are here, the Bible says that we are here to test our own work. Um, um, the best way we will ever grow as believers is one-on-one, -on -one, in a B group, in a small group, Sunday school, if you will. I don't know if you are in a B group or what I hope you are because you will grow as a Christian, as a believer, faster that way than I think anything else. You will. And that's my, my commercial for, for some of you. If you're not in a B, I don't maybe you all are, and that's great. But if you're not, you need to be in one. You need to be in a B group. I promise you, I promise you, you will grow. The reason I grow more as a believer is I, I was in a, in a B group in Mark where I could ask questions. He can ask me questions, and I grew so much. But we are here for personal growth. We are here to live out what we've learned in here. There's nothing worse than being a spiritual tick. You know what ticks are, right? They attach themselves and they just sit there, and then they just suck the life out of something, right? You know, we're supposed to exercise our faith. We're supposed to live it out, not just kind of come and absorb and take notes, and man, that's a good word, and then walk out the door. We're supposed to walk out and live it to the waitress or waiter we talk to, excuse me, server we talk to, or the mechanic we talk to, or the people we talk to. Again, we are designed to be relational. God said at the beginning, it's not good for us to be alone. We need each other. I need you all. You all need me. We're, we're doing this together. We're salt and light. We're supposed to add flavor and, and add light to people around us. Um, a lot of people just want to get by. I call it the checklist. I went to church, check. We sang, check. I gave a little bit, check. Uh, we took communion, check. Heard the message, check. I'm going to Cracker Barrel. I mean, really. And, and they're fine with that. They're okay with just this checklist mentality. It was never meant to be that way. We're supposed to learn and be under great, 
godly influences and then walk out the door and then start serving. It's not in here where we're serving. Here's where we worship. It's out there where we serve. Wherever you're at. And you may say, look, that's great, but you know, that's really what our pastors do. It's really not. Remember, you who are spiritual. And if you're not, okay. But you're here for a reason. You're here because God sent you here. You're here because you have a divine appointment here. You're here because I love the expectation. That's what I pray in our church. What we've done is we just don't expect God to do anything anymore. That's why people say, I went, did this, did this, this. Now I'm going to go to Applebee's. Because they don't expect God to do anything. I'm always expecting God to do something big. Always. I tell our team all the time, expect God to move today. Expect it. Don't ever get complacent. Expect it. Release your faith out there. Uh, we are here, say it with me. We are here to share our lives with each other. We are say, it says that let the one who's taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Um, again, Mark's my pastor. The pastor I have at home, great man, great Bible teacher. Uh, I serve with him, great man, but Mark's my pastor. So when things go on, I call Mark. I tell Pete, great man, I tell him, but I share with Mark. I tell Pete, there's a difference. Sharing is relational. Telling, telling is good, but sharing is relational. So when something goes on, you want to share that with the one who teaches. What, do you learn? what have you learned? He's been your pastor in 2010, okay, seven, eight years. So, you know, in seven or eight years, what have you learned from him and the staff that you can share with him? Um, I'm, sure there's, I'm sure there's all kinds of stories, and you should. You should. You know, I take notes. I told you I'd, I've got all his notes. I mean, he, would write, he could write it down a grocery list. I wouldn't have cared. I don't know what it was. He could wrote a love note to Rob, and I wouldn't have cared. I just wanted his notes. Still have them. I still have stuff because I was so hungry, and I wanted to do something with my life than just be a tick and just sit and absorb. I wanted to live it out. Uh, we are here to invest in eternity. Do not be deceived because God is not mocked. Whatever we put in the ground will come up. I personally don't like that verse. I work for a utility company. Uh, I'm the guy at home, not here, at home that will cut your power off if you don't pay your bill. That's me. I'm the jerk. Yeah, I am. I'm the guy that pulls up in my little car. I drive a Ford Escape. The guys call it a matchbox or a Hot Wheels. It's small, but a lot of work gets done out of that little car. I will pull up in the driveway. I've had kids press against the window. I've had kids come talk to me. Sir, what are you here to do? Where's your mom and dad at? They're inside. They sent me out here to talk to you. Isn't that terrible? Why don't you go get mom and dad and have them come out and talk to me, please? Anyway, that's what I do is I will, I, I take away. I said that to tell you this. I deal a lot with traffic, and I cut people off sometimes trying to get to a road. Because I put that in the ground, I have three or four people cut me off in the road the same day. Whatever you sow, you reap. Uh, my body is a product of sowing and reaping. When you have donuts, you look like a donut. And not the one with the hole in the middle, the cream-filled ones that are good and gooey. They're just good. The lemon glazed donut with the lemon filling. They're just good. I just like them better. They're just little white chocolate icing. Anybody have a donut? Okay. But also that means this. If you put love in the ground, if you put grace in the ground, you put peace in the ground, it comes up. Love that part of it. And so many people have put bitterness in the ground, and they're, they're angry, and they're robbing themselves of a blessing. It goes both ways. Whatever you sow, that you will reap. Whatever. So I choose love. I have not turned my back on anyone, anyone. If they need me, I will do my best to help them. I can't help everybody, but I promise I'll try. The people I encounter by what I do, if they will talk to me, I'm knocked on doors. I've seen how much they owe. I'm like, there's no way I'm cutting this off for 20 bucks. There's no way. Not with a $60 reconnect fee. That person who went from a $20 bill now is going to pay 80. I will beat the door down. 
Try, I'll try, I will help anyone. I've been to the worst neighborhood, been to the best neighborhood. I've had a gun pulled on me. I've had a baseball bat from an angry mom. I've seen it. But what do I do? The Bible says a kind answer turns away anger. Okay? So believe me, I have a kind answer tattooed to my tongue. So when I talk to people, hey, just, just talk to me. Tell me what's going on. So, but that's, sorry, I got all, I took a little rabbit trail. I apologize. Um, but we are here to sow in eternity. What we do in here is eternity. Releasing our worship, releasing our faith, all eternity. It's great to be able to love Jesus and to confess and to be healed and to just praise and worship. The Lord, I love, here's what I say about music. It's like the rotor tiller of the, of the heart that allows the word to be planted deeper. That's what I love about worship. It's if we start, if you notice any church you go to, anyone, they all start with music. Some do it really, really well. Some don't. But they still have music. And what's it do? It should till up. Because let me tell you, it's tough out here. I tell my kids all the time in, in my home, you want to get mad? Fine, get mad in here in our home. You want to cuss? Fine, cuss in our home. Because once you walk out the door, you're judged. Same thing for us. We're safe here. We're safe to confess. We're safe to praise. We're safe to lift our hands and worship. We're safe here. You walk out here, the world judges, and they're condemning. But thank God that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. We are here to serve one another. We, I started this whole thing by talking about restoration. If you think about this pattern, that really has to do with us. Each one of us have had the need of some kind of redemption or restoration only through the blood of Christ Jesus, and it ends with service. We're here to serve one another. I used to do assimilation in our church, and I love trying to connect people and where they need to be. Um, there, there was a guy in our church who was very angry um, uh, with his natural father. I went to go see him. We talked. Uh, he was going to leave the church. Turned out he was military trained, so we started a safety team, and he was our captain, uh, only because I just listened and thought, how can I connect him to this body? We didn't even have a team. He came on board, and boom, we have a great safety team now, but only because I listened and tried to help him find a, find a place. So I'm going to tell you, tell you three things that will be helpful, and I'm going to end. So the band, if you want to make your way back up, I'm going to tell you three things. Be a person that's present. Believe it or not, your presence here means something. When you're not here, you're missed. Not, not because of, of a natural thing, of a supernatural thing is why. If you're, like, if you're like me, the pastors here probably know where you sit. So when you're not there, they notice. That's how it is in my church. I can look this way and say, that family's usually there, they're not there. So your presence here is important. Remember, this is about people who are spiritual, you who are spiritual. Your presence is important to somebody beside you. You would never know that maybe something, a smile, a word, a touch, a handshake, a high five, a fist bump, something will mean something to somebody close to you. You don't know that. You, you may not know that. You may think, if I, if I didn't show up tomorrow, I'd never be missed. Yes, you would. Your presence, not just for the staff and, and as a body, it might be for a complete guest just by being present and saying a word of encouragement. Be a person that is productive. Use your gifts. Remember that insignificant gift about the staff? Use your spiritual gifts to serve. If you have a gift to teach, teach. If you have a gift to encourage, encourage. If you have a gift of mercy, then be merciful. Use your gifts. I'm sure that, that Mark and his staff have, have a, a design to help you find your spiritual gifts. If you don't know what they are, you should take those. They're really beneficial. Here's the third thing I'm going to tell you. Be a person that prays. You may not be able to stand with a microphone in your hand and the Bible open or play guitar or an instrument. You may not be able to do that, but you can hold a door open for somebody, and you can pray for somebody. Everybody in this room can do that. Everybody. Everybody's not gifted to do the same thing, but remember, we're the body of Christ. And some people forget that we're, we're, we're the body of Christ every day of the week, not just once on Saturday night or on a Wednesday night or in a B group. We're the body of Christ all the time, all the time. Would you stand?